air combat missions could be as dangerous, demanding, and potentially heartbreaking as the missions of forward air controllers in Vietnam. The ability of fighter-bomber crews to independently provide close air support proved to be extremely difficult. The ability of this airplane and their crews to find the enemy that made us so successful The North Vietnamese had never had anybody up there with a slow airplane to look at them. They'd send these RF-4s up there, Mohawks up there, to film them and look at the IRR or, or infrared. We found them. We found them. When I got up to North Vietnam, none of us knew anything about flying in North Vietnam. And here I go up there. All of a sudden, they had 37, 57 radar control quad 50s. You'd see a beehive, green beehive coming at you. They were all green tracers up there. And I used to pedal this thing as fast as it would go. It's a pretty hairy mission. We had no idea what we were getting into. Nobody told us how to fly against them. We just had to learn by ourselves. One thing that we didn't know, we always thought because of the water table that they couldn't dig down and hide. They had cities under there. They had hospitals under there. And when they kept coming out of this railroad bed, we were killing them right and left, and we, they're like little ants. We couldn't understand where they were coming until after the war, some of our comrades went into the DMZ and they said, geez, no wonder they, were, they could live down there. At that point, I'd open my window, take my M16, fully automatic, back seat would do the same thing, dive for the ground, tracers are coming up, and you go fully automatic, I'd fire with one hand, fly with the other. We'd make that one pass to keep the NVA's head down so they could, uh, our guys couldn't maneuver. Back seats cranking up the uh, artillery, and I'm calling Tom uh, Jones again saying, uh, I need some tack air. And he would get them, and he'd start bringing them up on the station. The fax mission was to quickly make sense of the situation from above and to call in airstrikes in support of the men below. A job he had to do with nothing more than a few radios, a few target marking rockets, and a lot of guts. To make matters worse, Fax often had to immediately weigh the risk of over-responding to frantic calls for help against the risk of losing men because of their own inaction. Sometimes they wouldn't tell you how close it was. They would just say bomb the target because they were in such dire straits that they needed air support and they needed it now. So you would ask them, you know, how close is this to you? They would say, don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Just put the bombs down. Fax performed several critical missions in Vietnam, but none were more important to the pilots than close air support. Many not only knew the troops they supported, they actually became close friends with them. The low, slow-flying facts were constantly in danger of being struck by what became known as the Golden BB, a single lucky shot that could end a pilot's life without warning. The simple old bird dog could actually withstand a significant amount of battle damage but its thin skin afforded absolutely no protection for the pilot. A basic flak vest was all they really had, and every pilot quickly learned how best to put it to use. 
vests. You know, if you were on the ground in a Ford, you know, when I was controlling, I'd wear the flak vest, but in the airplane, you didn't wear it. You sat on it because if you're going to get hit, it was going to come up through the floor or anything like that. There was no armor plate or anything in the old ones. It's just very thin aluminum. There's nothing in the seat. So we used to put it under the cushion, and we used to sit on our flak vest to get the biggest size possible, believe me. <laughs> Only the most accomplished and daring facts were invited to take part in the Ravens' covert campaign. The pilots largely operated on their own, conducting every type of fact mission imaginable from dozens of extremely rough remote airstrips located throughout Laos. Up there, we could end up doing anything literally on a moment's notice. We would, one mission, we would be with troops in contact, closer support with them. Another mission, we'd be out long range. We'd be busting trucks, doing regular interdiction, uh, or going up and supporting a, uh, uh, an outpost that had been surrounded by bad guys. When I was up as a raven, uh, we were the rules of engagement. I remember one day in particular, uh, there was a new guy up working northeast of me, and he tried to put in an airstrike, and he obviously did not know what he was doing or where he was, and was not following the proper procedure. So I just came up on the radio and I said, this is Raven 2-5, this is my sandbox. You will not drop, acknowledge. And they didn't drop, because it wasn't clear where they were, what they were bombing, or what they were doing. And so there was always that risk of, of killing friendlies or you know, or in, in some cases, just indigenous people that were friendly to us that we just wanted to try to leave alone. Few statistics were kept on the Ravens' clandestine operations, but it is clear that they suffered one of the highest loss rates of the entire conflict. Some have speculated that nearly half of the pilots never made it home. People who live by the rules usually made it home okay is when you tried to do something extra, sometimes because you were trying to help somebody else on the ground, or were trying to show off, or were doing something else stupid. That's when people get hurt. The complex saga of forward air controllers in Vietnam had a relatively simple beginning. In the summer of 1963, a single FAC unit the 19th Tactical Air Support Squadron was formed at Ben Hoa Air Base just outside the South Vietnamese capital of Saigon. The squadron was part of a broader American effort to advise and assist Vietnam in combating communist guerrillas known as the Viet Cong. The FACs were equipped with several Cessna 01s, small lightweight spotter planes known as bird dogs that carried nothing more than a few radios and four target marking rockets. Their mission was to train South Vietnamese pilots to perform reconnaissance, mark ground targets, and direct airstrikes in support of government forces on the ground. Initially, the pilots were to remain in country for no more than a year while training was completed. But American forward air controllers remained in Southeast Asia for much longer, and the scope and breadth of their mission expanded dramatically. The conventional forces coming into it, so came the air power, the jet fighter bombers. So they found out that here you had 450 knot fighter bombers trying to find targets in a close air support environment with friendly troops and said, how are we going to do this? And this is where the forward air controller really came into his own because he was the go-between between the ground forces and the fighter bombers. Three more tactical air support squadrons were activated by the Air Force in the spring of 65 to keep pace with escalating tensions. Many other facts also began flying for the U.S. Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, and for various South Vietnamese and Australian units. The limited range of the bird dogs forced most of the pilots to operate on their own from hundreds of rough, unfinished airstrips scattered throughout the country. But the basic components of their missions were largely the same.
the number one priority for all facts was responding to emergency calls from troops in contact. Once overhead, the FAC built a mental picture of the situation below by radioing ground commanders and carefully circling in for a closer look. At the same time, he began to search for the best form of available fire support. FACs could control several types of firepower, including helicopter gunships and land and sea-based artillery. But their primary resource was air power. Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps fighter bombers that staged from bases in South Vietnam and Thailand, and from carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin and the South China Sea. Vietnam. For a generation of American soldiers and airmen, the war in Southeast Asia quickly became a nightmarish blur. A battle with no clear goals, waged against a stealthy enemy amidst the dense jungle and rice paddies of strange lands. You were flying a little formation. All too often, the chaos of battle found Allied forces trapped and facing annihilation in jungle ambushes, firebase assaults, and bailouts over hostile territory. In these moments, a desperate call would be made for help from above. And once again, the fate of the man on the ground would rest in the hands of an airborne forward air control. Flying for the Air Force or Marine Corps, under a host of call signs, the forward air controllers, or FACs, shared a singularly hazardous role. At the controls of light propeller-driven aircraft, the facts patrolled low enough and slow enough to detect enemy troops, convoys, and bunkers cloaked in the triple canopy jungle. In the face of ground fire which could obliterate their small craft, the facts remained overhead, marking targets and orchestrating the incoming mix of fighter bombers, helicopters, or artillery needed to destroy the enemy threat. A spin is actually a prolonged stall in which the aircraft rotates around its center of gravity while losing altitude. The L-19 does not spin violently, and if you let go of your controls, it will recover by itself, provided it has sufficient altitude. So eager to get it on the ground that he rounds out a little high, and as the plane stalls, he bounces. He adds throttle for a go-around, but at that moment the plane touches down again. Now look. His feet are on the brakes. The plane swerves and he slams it in rudder and aileron to correct. The right brake goes down hard. A severely damaged L-19 caused by loss of directional control. ramp, where as always it is pointed away from the friendly areas. After shutdown, the crew chief grounds the aircraft by connecting a wire from the strut to a grounding stake. Now the crew chief checks to make certain all arming switches are safe and that the trigger safety pin is in position. Then moving to the side of the tubes, he safeties them by rotating each electrical contact out of position. When unloading or loading rockets, protective equipment should be worn and the loader must not stand behind the tubes. This aircraft is now disarmed. The rockets may safely be removed and returned to the ready area. Then the crew chief must clean any tubes that have been fired. An oily rag on the end of a long stick accomplishes this task. Meanwhile, nearby, another bird dog is being prepared for the next mission. The master switch, Grimes light, radios, navigation lights, and all rocket arming switches are turned on, except for the trigger switch. Then, with a voltmeter, the crew chief makes a stray voltage check of the contacts on the rocket tubes, so that stray voltage cannot fire the rockets prematurely.
Now certain that there is no stray voltage, all switches are turned off and the loading begins. Flying for the Air Force or Marine Corps, under a host of call signs, the forward air controllers, or FATs, shared a singularly hazardous role. At the controls of light propeller-driven aircraft, the FATs patrolled low enough and slow enough to detect enemy troops, convoys, and bunkers cloaked in the triple canopy jungle. In the face of ground fire which could obliterate their small craft, the facts remained overhead, marking targets and orchestrating the incoming mix of fighter bombers, helicopters, or artillery needed to destroy the enemy threat. We were young, we were aggressive, we thought we wouldn't take hits, and we couldn't die. They were the kind of guys who would ride to the sound of the guns, if you will, would look for and get into the action. And I think uh, that's, that's why we had a lot of guys get bagged. It really impacted on you. You really, truly did realize that, uh, you know, you may not make it out of here alive, and uh, you got to accept that uh, or not do the job. Thanks to their prowess, the fact was accorded deadly reverence by a vengeful enemy. They despised us, and if they shot one of us down, they normally killed you on the spot. Forward air controllers played a critical role in the war in Southeast Asia from the beginning until the bitter end. In fact, much of the massive, multifaceted American campaign would have been extremely difficult, if not impossible, without their most unusual and daring form of support. The fact that two of the 12 Air Force Medal of Honor recipients in Vietnam were facts attests to the skill and courage needed to perform their incredible missions. <laughs>